Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. It's time for the Happy Hour Live webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie in the WhiskeyCast studio. Hope you have had a good week. Uh, I was out in Kentucky earlier this week, spent a couple of days with the folks at Castle and Key Distillery. We'll have more on that on this weekend's uh, WhiskeyCast podcast. But a uh, beautiful place out there. If you know the story, they built that... Uh, basically restoring the historic old Taylor distillery that had been literally 10 years ago when I was at that distillery. They had not touched it in 40 years, and there was literally a jungle. It looked, uh, a lot of folks described it as looking a lot like Vietnam out there. When they went through, it took uh, almost two years just to get things shaped up to the point where they could even start getting close to back to distilling again, let alone uh, being able to welcome visitors. But uh, I'll be posting some pictures from there on uh, social media this weekend and uh, more on the podcast this coming weekend on next week's episode as well. want to bring in our guest right now, my buddy Fred Minnick. How you doing, brother? Hey, Mark. It's good to see you. Good to hear from you. How you doing? Uh, doing great. It's been too long since we've had a chance to sit down together. I, I agree. Uh, you know, having two young ones, uh, you were so kind. Last time we hung out, I got to bring my kids along. And, uh, you know, that was when they were still respectful and uh, <laughs> minded themselves at the table. Uh, th those days are gone. <laughs> well, they're how old are Julian and Oscar now? Uh, Julian is three, and I, I, he's a, he's in the 1% for size and, and uh, for, for weight and height. And so he looks like he's five. And and uh, Oscar is uh, is eight. And I mean, it, when we wrestle and that kid punches you, I mean, I'll have a bruise for a week. So that's uh, yeah, that's what I got, you know, going on you know, in addition to all the all the whiskey stuff. I was listening to you talking about Castle and Key. I remember I snuck on because uh, you remember before before Castle and Key bought it, there was this company that owned them and they would pick apart pieces and they would sell them uh, for people to build stuff. This is like 2010. I snuck on there and took a bunch of pictures, and it looked like uh, it looked like scenes out of a war zone. Um, there was like just collapsed brick everywhere. There were there were dehydrated barrels with uh, with um, like brush decaying on them. There was like I don't know what it is about raccoons, but raccoons. <laughs> Raccoons in Kentucky, they find it in an abandoned building and they're like, hey, it's pee time. And so they would all go in these like they would go in the warehouse and they and all these raccoons would pee. And raccoon pee is the is so stinky. Oh, the guys were telling me that when they opened up the castle for the first time, they literally had to. Uh, take the boards off the windows and take some of the bricks out to let the raccoons get out before they could even get in there to see what they'd gotten themselves into. I mean, you, they probably had like 12 generations of raccoons in there. You know, you probably had like a, a raccoon mafia going on. That and, and the like, copperhead mafia too. Ooh, yeah, that's... They that, had that's, a boatload of copperheads. Yeah, because they're right there on that river too. Like you just, oof, copperhead, man, you get bit by them in the wrong time and they'll kill you. Oh, yeah. But now they've got uh, lush green landscaping all over the place. The flowers will be coming out soon with the spring coming. Uh, from what I hear, they cut a, cut a couple of herons and uh, some birds that have now made the river area home. And oh, nice. uh, they've got the koi back in the ponds and everything. And uh, it, it is just stunning to see what they've done with that place. Uh, yeah. I share your, uh, your thoughts about going out there 10 years ago, I was out there literally 10 years ago this week, snuck onto the site to take some pictures too. Uh, did you get caught? Uh, I did not get caught. Uh, you got lucky. Fact, yeah, I got, I, I got, I, I was good. Um, and then uh, I later did like an official like uh, tour with the guy who was keeping the grounds. And, and it was because I had an interest in the uh, revolutionary war soldier who was buried across the across the street and the guy was like you know this is the main reason you know i try to keep this and i was yeah. like that 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 little interest uh was just like oh, i don't care i'll let you in let's go come on so yeah he caught me and i had to go pay my respects at the gravesite before he would uh, let me leave without a ticket yeah 
And, it, and he probably had uh, also probably considered shooting you before no. he, you know, he probably was packing a little bit, you know. No, actually, I was back on the street on the road by the time he caught me. Okay. Well, but he asked good. me, did you go on the property? And I admitted, yes, sir, I did. Yeah. Because yeah. he was in uniform. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he, uh, I got to say, I mean, like, I remember, like, I was like, teenagers were totally going there and like doing teenager stuff uh so uh i you know they uh i'm glad i'm glad castle and key came in and saved it and the the whole you know the whole lawsuit that ensued um after they got it with the use of taylor and you know i just feel like they the, the people who own that have been through so much and uh, you know, they had some environmental stuff, you know, the, you know, they had Marianne, she left and, you know, I just, I really, you know, we're, we're in the exact same spot. We never want anyone to fail. We always want people's whiskey to be good. And if it's not good, we say so, but sometimes there are people that you really root for and yeah. I really do root for Castle and Key because of the, the incredible investment they put into that place. Well, I had the chance to taste their first bourbon that's being released officially this coming Monday, and mm -hmm. I'm very impressed with it. I've also tasted batch two that'll be coming out soon after that uh, because they're batching, mm -hmm. and it's going to be good. I think you're going to like them both. Well, I remember tasting out of the barrel uh, with with Marianne and uh, when the when the bourbon was like two years old, and it was it was far tastier than most two year old bourbon. And then I tasted uh, again, uh, probably, probably a year ago, out of the barrel, and I was like, "This stuff is amazing." Uh, yeah. The problem with Castle and Key is like, if you're going in and tasting barrels, they do so much contract aging for people. Like, I don't know whose is whose, and so like, there's Penelope in there. There's even been some barrel in there. I mean, there's been whiskey from so many different people in there. We are getting, a, oh, you're going to love this, being a photographer as well. Um, Kentucky Spirits was in there 20 years ago with a oh. black and white 4 by 5 large format camera. Wow. And didn't get caught. How they, how you never get caught with one of those big monstrosities is amazing. Yeah, that is, that's a, that's like, a, that's like one step away from like having to put your. Uh, oh, that, yeah, it's got the hood. It's, it's, that one would have the hood. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big ass camera. I don't know. And he never got that. caught. Now we are getting a certain amount of grief for you. Um, no, let's usual. see here. Crump the cask hole. This is not Fred. No ascot equals fake Fred. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I'm I am known for wearing the ascot, but I don't wear it all the time. Um, I have many ascots, uh, obviously, but you know sometimes I'm just in a hoodie and <laughs> or. Or just like in in workout clothes, but uh, you know today, uh, today was a today was a was a weird day. So I just kind of like I was just kind of like in kind of like comfy mode all day. <laughs> so uh, what's in your glass tonight? Uh, I was I was looking around the room of uh, something that because you know we're talking about happy hour, and so this is not, this is an area where I want to enjoy it. You know, versus like, you know, break it down like critically. And that's that's sometimes difficult for me. Uh, but there's a couple products that I just like. I just like drinking like I, I really, really enjoy um, the Ingram River Aged. This is, uh, you know, 105 proof. It just it, I love the way it tastes. I, w I love the way uh, the mouthfeel is and the finish. And, you know, this is uh, this is a new this is a new kind of like contract distilled or sourced uh, bottler. And they're, they're really just, uh, I, I, they came, came out of the gate swinging, swinging pretty strong in my opinion for a, uh, for a first, uh, for a first product. First, I've got for an early, new distillery, new company. I've got to admit, I'm not familiar with that one yet, but I'm looking forward to trying it. I decided to pick since it's uh, St. Patrick's day week coming up. We're now less than a week away. I went with the, uh, our good friends at Riders Tears, they're double O. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm not a very sentimental person. Like it'll be, it it could be like uh like a holiday where you're supposed to eat or drink something. Uh, I'd never. I'm horrible with that. But that's that's a good sentiment. I like that. 
And we've got some folks, including <laughs> our pal Tyrone Cote, drinking some 30 plus year old Armagnac and things like that out there. Um, Dave Kuhn has some Fagiel 21 Brook Laddie, Laddie Origins. Mm. Uh, there's a Brook Laddie 3D3, an old one in the audience. And Chris Danzenko says, We never noticed, Fred, apparently uh, the ascot. <laughs> <laughs> How did you start wearing those in the first place? So I always, I always loved, uh, loved uh, the the attire, uh, and they were often in like detective shows in uh, when I was growing up in the in the eighties. Like if you watch, uh, like we we watched Murder She Wrote in our house, and you know there was always like someone wearing an ascot. Uh, we watched, uh, you know, something like. Um, Oh gosh, I, I can't remember the name of them all, but '80s detective movies—they would always have ascots. And and so when I moved to Kentucky, we were going to go to the Kentucky Derby, and I went around shopping for ascots. This is 2006, seven, somewhere around there. And I walked into Von Mar and I asked for ascots. They looked at me and laughed. And you know, all the other department stores I went to—they just like most people didn't know what one was. And I just kind of like, you know, moved on and just the next thing. And my career was just kind of, you know, beginning. And I was a I was writing about wine um, probably more so early in my career uh, than, than whiskey. But eventually I would write equally. And now it's entirely whiskey. But I would get uh, I would go on a lot of wine trips and I would spend a lot of time with wine writers from all over the world. And there was this. um this wine writer it from uh from from new york he was like a legend he's like a uh, icon he used to be the editor of a magazine called hemispheres and he um he's he was an og wine writer and he wore ascots everywhere he was in his like late 60s and just basically you know ignoring all the pr people and the wineries and everything and just kind of like doing walking around doing his own thing and it's just like man this guy is so cool and my wife was with me and she and he was just really into Jacqueline. And, you know, I was like trying to ask him questions and all that about the, his career and how he got where he was. He's like, ah, you know, kind of get away. And he kept he kept like he's like, Fred, your wife is beautiful. And he, would, he was like hitting on my wife like this entire time right in front of me. And I was just like, man, this guy, this guy's got some moxie. And I asked him, like, how how can I find ascots? How can I get them? And he just kind of like, you know, pushed me off a little bit. And and then when we get home, there's a package for me waiting. And he had he had his wife make me three ascots. And he wrote me a note and said, tell your beautiful wife. I said, hi. And so like he gave me he gave me these at my first ascots and I started wearing them and then I learned you basically look around at like at estate sales, uh, thrift shops, basically any secondhand store, because very rarely do you see ascots actually be made. You will see them on Amazon. There will be really uh, thin silk, cheap versions of ascots on Amazon, but they they often are advertised, but not in stock. I, I know this because I've tried to buy a few. <laughs> Now we have a question for you. And before we get to the question, I want to, you've got, you had some breaking news that you broke earlier today out of uh, Frankfurt at the legislature on this uh, private oh, barrel select yeah, yeah, act. Yeah. Tell us what you found out and uh, I'll follow up with it. Yeah. So uh, basically, in fact, let me go on right here. Let me find my, let me find my notes, but basically uh, what, what we, what, what has, go, what is going on? Is you know private barrels were uh, were not the Kentucky ABC, which is a governing body of regulating alcohol, was not comfortable with people coming in and selecting barrels um, and bottling because it violated sample size, it viol violated packaging laws, it, it violated what they thought to be um, uh, some some protection laws for for retailers. Uh, and it also violated the, uh, the package. Like there's not an actual law that says you can drink from the barrel. And so, but most importantly, a private barrel was not even defined in the Kentucky code. And so there were two bills 
that were introduced to save private barrels. One was in the Senate, uh, SB 160, which basically is a bare bones, defines the defines the um, defines private barrels and just gets it in the code. Everyone's safe. It's all fine. And then HB 500 was a bill that allowed for it was introduced in the House, uh, a pastor committee and was going uh, was going up for a vote in the House. And um, and it, it basically allowed distillers to sell a, a private barrel to you and buy it right there on the site. It allowed uh, distillers to to sell um, distillery only releases like very special bottles just there at their distillery gift shop. It also allowed them to create uh, satellite tasting rooms. So if Jim Beam wanted to open a tasting room in Northern Kentucky, they could they they could do that. The wholesalers were opposed. Uh, basically, typically, whenever the the wholesaler anything kind of like uh, breaks up the three tier system, in which a distillery is selling their own product out of their gift shop breaks that up, and the retailers were opposed to that because they were afraid like the limited edition allocated products were were going to um, uh, were basically going to take away from from their allocation and it just uh it, it passed the house and there was a it passed the house 75 17 and there were some compromises made with uh with the wholesalers and uh retailers so now they're they're all on board uh basically the there's a there's some limitations on on what they allow so let me go through some notes here I know one of them I saw the news release too while you're going through your notes was mm -hmm. that uh, distilleries can sell 30% thir of their total private barrel allocation directly mm -hmm. without having to go through the three tier system. Uh, you mentioned the part about distillery exclusive bottlings, and this clarifies a bunch of the other language too that uh, people had sort of been operating with, and the ABC had been essentially looking the other way mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah, I think the big one, the big one that was, uh, that was the win for the change was that 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 bottle that can only be sold in the gift shop can only they they changed the language where it can only be sold in the gift shop, like or it can only be sold to still it cannot be sold anywhere else. So like, uh, which, which was the opposite of the way it was before. It had to be available to other retailers, right? And that's and I think honestly. As someone who negotiates and you know and and sees negotiations play out, I, I almost feel like that was a that was like a little carrot dangled, and you know I, I feel like the everybody's happy here, but I feel like the distillers got got a big win if, if HB five hundred uh, passes and becomes law, I think that's a huge win because what's happening, Mark, is that. The Kentucky Bourbon Trail is the it's it's a bucket list item, and people come here and they're like, "I want to get a bottle that I can't get anywhere else." And they show up here and they can't find Weller, and they they get told that the bottle to get is Heaven Hill Green Label Six Year Old. You can't even find that anymore. So like, there's like nothing special to when you come down here to buy outside of you know what you can probably get in your market if it's a decent market. And so the distillers really needed that because we're we're starting to see, you know, people are either coming on their second trip, uh, but the bucket list check marks, you know, that's waning. And, you know, in order for tourism to grow, those bottles have got to be connected uh, to the effort. And I don't think you should ever forget about the retailers like Westport Whiskey and Wine is, is an amazing retailer that is uh, uh, has. Chris Zaborowski has one of the best palates in, in all of whiskey and he picks yeah. great barrels. So um, I, I would say that this is the, the part about the private barrels going away. That was scary as shit, you know, because that was, it's very real. It could have went away, but it looks like everything's going to be saved. Um, one of the, now that they both go in to vote uh, to vote in the house and or the Senate for the SB 160 and HB 500, you know, one of those are going to come through and private barrels are going to be saved. I have full confidence of that. That's going to happen. Are all the add-ons going to happen? Well, now there's going to be a lot of jockeying in the Senate um, to make to 
over that because what there's still retailers who are opposed to it, but the majority of them are for it. The other side is, and this is where Kentucky politics is. This is the, this is the part of Kentucky politics. It's not public. It's not very well known. And that is they will only vote on one alcohol bill per year. Like they will only like bring one alcohol bill through because the, the Democrat and Republican leaders basically have a uh, like a like a truce that they won't do too much because it might upset the dry county uh, constituents. You know, if they if uh, Johnny Bob Preacher ends up supporting too many bourbon bills, Johnny Bob Preacher is going to lose his uh, his constituents in, in dry county, Kentucky. And that's a very real situation for a lot of those politicians. And there are politicians down there. Well, the, the folks in the dry counties take that very seriously. What's that? The folks in the dry counties take that very seriously. Yes. Yes. It's they, they, they do. I mean, I remember when uh, Grayson County was up for a vote. It was like you were, uh, it's like we were in 1919. There were signs up saying that uh, alcohol is the devil and you'll go to hell if you, if you get drunk. I'm like, I, I'm, is this really happening? Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, if you, if you look a little bit under the sheets, you'll find a bootlegger, uh, who's campaigning for, for, uh, the dry County to stay because, you know, he's selling maker's mark for 40 bucks out of his broom closet. So I, I, the whole, the whole dry County law, I mean, I realize that it's, it's, it's a County's right to do it, but I, I think it's just, it's antiquated. And you take a look at some of those streets in those dry counties, look at the schools, you know, all bourbon could be helping build roads and schools for those respective counties, like in Anderson County, go to Anderson County, look at those roads in Anderson County. Uh, those are, there's not potholes. The school looks pristine. That's all built by wild Turkey and four roses by their taxes. While we're talking about the retail side, Tyron Cote up in Nova Scotia has a question. What's the deal with certain retailers in the U.S. and crazy markups on these special releases? I see so many complaints from U.S.-based people. Yeah, that's the $1,000 bottle of Van Winkle 10-year-old. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things to this. One, it's the supply of uh, law, uh, the, uh, the, what's the, what's the uh, law of uh, supply and demand. It's that, right? It's a little bit of that. But also there's there's nothing that a distiller can do to tell that retailer to change their pricing. And this goes back to pri price fixing schemes in the 1940s and 50s. And ironically, Pappy Van Winkle was the guy that was challenging price fixing uh, in the Senate. So there's like testimony from Pappy Van Winkle uh, countering like the, the growth of price fixing by the larger distillers. Uh, so the there's actions that they can take, like you maybe the distributor cuts off an allocation or something if the if they're not happy. But at the end of the day, these uh, these retailers are within their rights to do that. And there's the only way that it can stop is if people stop paying for it. But every every time uh, every every week I get emails from people. I want a four hundred dollar bourbon. I want a two hundred dollar bourbon, and it is it's ridiculous that people think you have to spend big money to do it. And and a lot of that could be solved on some of these allocated products if the SRP better reflected the demand. And I don't think I I realize that companies like Sazerac have a dream of of like. Uh, a person being able to find and buy uh, a bottle of Pappy 23 for 329 or whatever the SRP is, but it's just not realistic. You know, uh, the actual value of Pappy 23 is two to five thousand dollars, you know, depending on what what vintage it is. And that's that's what the secondary market has shown. And they have spent so much time you know, trying to take down the secondary market when that was real time data of of what the demand was. And once the secondary market went away, where we, there was kind of like it kind of like took care of itself, you started seeing more fakes like intercirculation and less educated buyers getting, um, you know, getting swindled. So I, there's this 
there's this whole there's there's a lot of issues here to unfold and it's and it's hard to just answer it. I know someone from Nova Scotia is looking at this probably with some popcorn and saying like, ha, ha, ha. but, but then again, he's sitting up there in a province that has a provincial liquor control board running what he can and can't buy locally yeah. and setting the price tag on it too. So and the other thing is too, is like, it varies by state because of taxes, like the state of Washington has a, uh, has a tax of a, uh, I think their tax on uh, on spirits is like thirty five percent. So I mean, and Kentucky has a as a tax on wholesale cases as well. So there's like all kinds of crazy taxes that end up, you know, changing the uh, changing the uh, the price in the store. Dave Kuhn wants to know: Would raising the wholesale price on these bottles prevent shops from hoarding them and jacking up the price? It might, but it'll just raise prices for everything else because yeah. they're still going to make their profit margin. Yeah, that and that's the uh, that's the distil the distillers set the SRP. The distributors typically will pay. Well, when they buy when they buy a product, they typically buy half at half of the SRP, and then mark it up uh, twenty, you know, fifteen twenty percent to the retailer. So the retailer's margin is twenty percent typically or 20 30 percent and so that's that's the game and so if they have a bottle that is um you know that they can jack up to get more i mean i'd be all for it you know if 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 that is there i'd be all for it if it wasn't so uh, egregious but we're not looking at you know it it's not like someone can go and get that bottle somewhere else another thing if i'm a retailer I, I would be very I would be very cautious about how I handle Pappy. Uh, there's there's a retailer in, in Louisville that offloads his allocation every year to a handful of people. He just gets his allocation, he makes a phone call, he just does a case deal with them, and those people turn around, sell it on the secondary. You know, is he culpable in that? Yeah. But yeah. he's also not he's also not having to deal with the uh the backlash of of having a pappy raffle which you know you go to a liquor barn on a pappy raffle you would think everybody would be happy the most miserable people you'll ever see in your life because you know, everybody no one got it and they all, everybody has a story as like why they should have gotten it's 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 a horrible situation it really is it leads to a whole lot of envy a whole lot of uh yeah all those Let's see, how many of the seven deadly sins, uh, lust, uh, gluttony, envy? I think, well, we can eliminate sloth out of there. Yeah. Well, I think there's like lying, adultery, murder. You know, I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff going on there. We, but um, And then we get into the bars that charge prices for these. I was in a Lexington this week and at a bourbon bar that was charging... Ninety-five dollars a pour for Orphan Barrel rhetoric. Well, you know going, they. Oh yeah, that's, was, I'm going to pay that. But that was uh, the the Orphan Barrel was was lost at sea, and this in this store, <laughs> they found it at sea and they bottled it, and so it just made it all the more valuable, right? Um, I mean, look, I, the sea washed it back into a warehouse at Stitzelweller, well six hundred yeah. miles inland. <laughs> Which oddly, it never, it never. Uh, uh, anyway, that the whole Orphan Barrel series, actually, Rhetoric is the one that I really like out of that series. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, I mean, I am glad I don't have to price things. I'll just put it that way because it's challenging. And, and you know how many shots of that they or how many pours of that they probably sell a week? They probably sell five or six a week, you know? that's And so... If if they can do it, I mean, I hope they're preserving their bottles right, so it doesn't uh, get oxidized when they pour it. But um, and I hope they're breaking the bottles when they finish them off, so they don't wind up on the secondary market being faked and refilled. Yeah. Or what's worse is like if they refill them the themselves. Yeah. Those are the those are the cheating cheaters. Those there's a special place in hell for those bastards. Mm hmm. Now, you've gotten into music a lot lately with your podcast and a lot of yep. the interviews you're doing. Dave mm -hmm. Kuhn wants to hear about the time you interviewed his hero, David Byrne, from Talking Heads. 
Oh my God. Uh, so talking heads came, uh, came into my, uh, David came into my trailer, uh, wanting to drink bourbon with me. And it was not even, it was not even a setup to be, uh, an, an interview. I just had all this equipment in there and like, I was done with my interviews and I was like, Hey, do you, would you do an interview with me? Um, and he was like, yeah, I'll do it. And so we mic'd him up, we sat down and we just, we just started talking about the most random shit. Like, uh, I remember talking about horses and like, and then it was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> just like put the glass down and, but he was, uh, he was great. Um, and he's like, he's probably, he's very cerebral. Uh, he's exactly as weird as you would expect him to be in person. But, um, I'll say this. I mean, he, he tasted, he tasted like somebody who tastes for a living, you know? And that was very, that was very early in my, uh, celebrity interviews. And, and that was probably, probably the most at ease I'd felt with someone at, you know, at, at that point, because he was so, um, it was just like comforting dude, just wanting to talk, but definitely weird, which I live in the weird. So he and I, you know, really hit it off. Alan C points out that on the video from that interview, it seems like David Byrne almost never made eye contact with you the whole time. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, he was he kept going all over the place and was kept looking at the bottles and and um the one thing about uh David Byrne is like almost everybody who ever interviews him is told not to bring up the talking heads. Uh and and he won't talk about them. And so like that took off like my a big chunk of my um what I could talk to him about and I didn't I had no prep for him. And so it was just weird random you know conversation. And the one thing, the way he responded to things, he would say, oh, boy. And that was like, I had never heard anyone. I hadn't heard anyone like go, oh, boy, like that since like, a, you know, a, like a 1960s sitcom. I mean, he just had this like uh, just the way his his diction and his uh, his style of talking was was very interesting to me. With these other musicians, how well do they understand bourbon when they come into the room with you? Uh, very, very rarely do I get a, um, get someone who, who is at a high level. Uh, Derek Trucks um, was, uh, was right there. And I think Derek is one of the top five living guitarists right now. Um, you know, he, he could break it down. He knew whiskey. He had a guy in Lexington that bought his whiskey. Um, let's see. Um, most of the time after like, you know, learning the process a little bit, you know, they're, they're really, really into it. But the, so Derek trucks, uh, Scott Ian of anthrax, he really knows his bourbon and, and like he, he, um, he didn't really apply a lot of tasting techniques to it but he savored it like he was a real slow drinker. And, uh, and so, so Scott Ian of anthrax probably up there. Um, and then the Brad who is jizz Mac and gore, super, super geeky, knowledgeable, uh, whiskey guy. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of people like that, but most of the time they are curious and want to learn. And my hope is, is that, you know, the next time they go out they're they're buying bourbon and using their influence for people to enjoy whiskey instead of, uh, you know, vodka. So as we all know, vodka sucks by God. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fun watching you do these interviews because the guys come in and they're used to being fanboyed all the time, but they come in and they're fanboying you. Yeah, that's that. That's often the case, and it's a little. It can be. It can be weird, um, like Terry Bradshaw, having Terry Bradshaw on. Like he just, like he. I mean, he was on Fox Fox News or Fox, one of the Fox shows, and he's talking about how I. He's been like. 
five or six seconds of his time talking about how he got to hang out with me and drink bourbon with me. And, and I just like, that's kind of weird. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I'll ever get used to it. Um, it's cool. I mean, I've had, you know, you know, Peyton Manning's gone around like saying like, I'm a really intense, uh, whiskey guy. Which, you know, <laughs> we that was to get Peyton. Peyton had to have like a certain amount of like prep time before he would talk to me. And and he was, you know, he came and he tried to start talking. He was talking whiskey a little bit. And, uh, you know, he did all right. He did all right. But but like most of them are most of them are uh, just wanting to learn what's happening a lot, though. I get I get confirmations for bookings and then people are like, oh, well, he's sober now or she's taking a cleanse or, you know, they're taking a break from drinking. And so I'm having to switch up to coffee here and there, but which is, is inevitable. But like, I mean, I've had I've had musicians who would uh, who sipped with me and then they went off and got like batshit drunk. And so then they blame me. So. You know, it's probably <laughs> of course good. they're going to blame the media guy every time. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I bust on you a little bit occasionally because you have people now. I don't have people. You have people, including an agent that was responsible. From what I understand, you had a role in helping ZZ Top and Balconis get together on Trey's Hombres. Yeah, I want to hear your side of this. Yeah, so. Uh, ZZ Top and I have the have the same um, uh, management company, uh, Shelter Music, which also uh, represents uh, Tool, uh, Fleetwood Mac, uh, ZZ, of course, and and I am um, I'm their whiskey guy, and they reached out to me, and uh, ZZ Top did, and asked me like, hey, do you know any, do you know any, um, you know, Texas whiskey brands? that would be interested in doing a whiskey with this, you know? And I, I obviously that I, I know everybody and I'm just like, yeah, I, I know, uh, I think Balconis would be perfect for this. So I was like texting with Jared saying, Hey, would you like to do a whiskey with the, uh, with a, uh, with a band? And they, he was like, yeah. And, and by the way, I don't make any money off of this. I don't charge. I mean, this is what I do. Like I'm a, I, I like helping friends um, yeah. and I put stuff out there and uh, but I don't I mean, I didn't make anything off of that. I was probably could probably why well, I'm not the best at business, but I don't I don't take advantage of stuff like that. And I, I made the introduction and then it voila, it happened. Um, I've helped a few other few other friends out like that. But yeah, I mean, I have yeah. I have a lot of access to the music world and celebrities in general. And now you have all of these, um, you have all of these, everybody wanting to get into whiskey uh, or some type of spirit. And th they will often call me and ask if like this whiskey company is legit or, uh, or whatever. And sometimes they'll ask for my help, but you know, for the most part, it's just, it's just me making an introduction here and there, but yeah, that's, that's how ZZ came together. And as Dave Kuhn points out, Peyton Manning calling someone intense is the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it might have been because at the very end of the interview, I said that they were too expensive. And, you know, um, his Sweetens Cove stuff. Yeah. I said, I was like, look, you know, you're, you're selling, you, you basically have created a whiskey for people on the sweets. You know, you need to, you need a whiskey that the general admission folks can afford. And it's like, this is too expensive for what it is. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a lot like you that I can't keep my mouth shut if I'm thinking something. Mm -hmm. So I, that's uh that's kind of how that went down. <laughs> <laughs> Got to pour a little bit more of the writer's tears, double Oak here question for you from Dave Kuhn as well. Speaking of tourism, what's your opinion? What in your opinion is the best bourbon distillery tour or experience in Kentucky in terms of value information or uniqueness? Well, what has happened, um, in the last five years, they have, they've all kind of like gone away from, um, 
they've all kind of gone away from like the original authentic feel of a bourbon tour in my opinion they're all li literally scripted now and they're all like trying to weave in the history of bourbon and weave in the importance of their respective distillery and i get I get a little concerned about that, and I'm reminded of uh, Dominic uh, Roscow's uh, quote a long time ago in an interview where he said that, you know, whiskey writing is just helping PR because whether you like it or not, you, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but he's like, whether you like something uh, or, or not, everyone's going to go by and find out. And that's help. That's PR for them. And so even even if you're a critic, you're still helping the brands, even if you don't intend to. Um, and I feel like the, the pendulum has shifted from, from, uh, objective independent knowledge, uh, being introduced to the public from the, the likes of, um, unbiased magazines, uh, and blogs and so forth to the brands who have massive social media followings and have hundreds of thousands of people coming to their distillery every year. It has shifted to them and they own the narrative the distilleries own the narrative of what the history of whiskey is of what uh of what the consumer uh will get to learn in that experience and with all that being said i like distilleries that break away from their from their uh their script that you get people and i think buffalo trace does a, a great job a great job of being as um, being as objective as they can be without, you know, without promoing themselves too much. Now, do they promo themselves? Absolutely. But I still think their tour is, is rock solid. Uh, I am a personal fan of maker's Mark, but just know when you go on a maker's Mark tour, you're getting a big dose of everything maker's Mark everywhere you turn. And, and and sometimes that strikes people the wrong way uh, on the smaller ones i love evan williams like downtown um in lexington i'm a big fan of town branch i think you get a little bit more perspective of beer in um in lawrenceburg uh wild turkey's uh, visitor center is out of operation right now but i think you get a lot of science uh discovery at um uh, at four roses and then speaking of science in danville uh, wilderness trail and i realized i didn't really answer the question but i gave said a little something for everything but and buffalo trace if you can get freddie johnson on the tour that's oh, yeah. what you want as some of our viewers have pointed out yeah yeah absolutely i mean freddie is just uh, a fountain of information and he'll tell it to you straight oh absolutely and and there's also you know uh there's another tour guide there named fred i mean you see a theme there you know their great tour guides are fred or freddie uh, but, uh, he gives a very good tour as well. Um, and one of the things that separates them is like how they will all show you the horse hair in the, in the brick. And like, that's just such a, that's a story of, of, uh, of architectural history. I like, I love that when they do that. So, but I will, I will admit, I don't go on tours as much as I used to because, um, you, you know, because for a lot of reasons, but, um, you know, how many, I can't count how many celery tours, tours I've been on, but yeah. I would rather go out and find a, something in the middle of nowhere in Idaho or Colorado than, uh, than that's something that's found. That's kind of, I'm really into that right now. Like finding the, the hidden gems, uh, out there that will probably break in the next five years. Oh, I agree with that completely. Uh, there's uh there are so many gems out there that uh, we still have yet to discover mm -hmm. that are people who are making really good whiskey now that uh, we didn't we would never have been on paid any attention to them five ten years ago and when it comes to Kentucky I mean I haven't seen half of the new visitor centers that have opened up because of uh, just not being able to get out there in the last couple of years and with all the expansion that's going on I mean probably probably just about every major distillery has upgraded its visitors experience That's right. since I've been there. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what I'm going to go to next, Mark. What am I, am I staying in bourbon? Do I venture out in scotch? Yeah. Let's stay on uh, scotch. What's your favorite, uh, 
The question we had from Graham Frazier, if you drink something that's not bourbon, what would it be? Do you have a favorite scotch? Um, I do love scotch. Um, in fact, I'll go ahead and pour me some Glen Grant 60-year-old. I finished off my sample of that. Is that wrong? Can I go ahead and sip down here? Go right ahead. Yeah. Loved that one. Yeah, I, I did too. I won't pour it all so I can have some more for later. Oh, yeah. I, I stretched that out over a long time. And that's the uh, this is the part of the job that you're like, ah, oh, I love what I do. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's that uh, I love this job moment that when I post that on social media, we get the, yeah, we like your job too, jackass. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, and I remember, I don't know if you remember, I told you I was going back and listening to your old episodes. And uh, I, I started because, um, you know, you had an old, you had uh, an early interview with Parker and I just wanted to hear his voice. And um, in, in that episode, you said, now I'm going to, I'm never going to review uh, whiskeys on this. Podcast. That was the very first episode. That yeah. was 17 years ago, for Christ's <laughs> sakes. I should tell everyone here. Yeah, go ahead. I did. I did call you the uh, NPR of whiskey. Um, I don't remember who that was for. Parade uh, Magazine. I remember Parade it. Parade Magazine. Your 500th episode. I did a feature on you for Parade Magazine. Some little old lady, you know, in the nursing home probably pulled it out. It was like, oh, look, here's the NPR of whiskey. And then, and then learned what podcasting was right then and there. <laughs> Now everyone, now so, everyone's got a podcast, including yeah. So. And back then, Parade Magazine. For those of you who don't remember, was this little insert that was going to the back of local newspapers on their Sunday editions, and it was this. Uh, I think it wound up in USA Today occasionally as uh, an insert yeah. at some point, yeah. and eventually faded away completely, from what I understand. Yeah, although I, I, I have no idea. I, all I know is that I. It's the only only time I ever gave away my my copyright uh, for someone I wrote for, and I see my articles pop up all the time in like uh, like new websites. Like they have like sold they sold like a bunch of uh, a bunch of those collection of old articles to these new you know new content grab kind of places. So, um, and I had a lot of good cocktail recipes when I was working with them. So, so you mentioned uh, going out trying to find some of these hidden gems. Um, actually, before mm -hmm. we get to there, I want to go back to the tourism side for a second, mm -hmm. because we were talking about castle and key earlier. They just completely uh, revamped their tours to where it's now going to be more of an open campus walk. Mm. And they're not going to do the guided tours. They're going to open up the, uh, the old Taylor distillery site and well, castle and key now. And just let you walk around and do more unscripted, unguided tours. And there'll be people there that you can ask questions of when you uh, walk into, say, the still house or whatever. There'll be people there to answer your questions and uh, help you with stuff. But they're going to let people do more exploring around the property. Well, I think that's probably all well and good till they find a find a couple in the warehouse, you know, stripped down naked on a barrel or something. You know, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's the sort of thing like the uh, the. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, if I would do that. If I had a distillery, I wouldn't let people just walk around. There's way too many hazards out there, especially over there. With you got that, uh, uh, you got that river. I mean, yeah. I feel like that's that's almost their. Uh, what, what's the what's the person called that does risk assessment? They, the risk assessment officer of yeah. Brown Foreman would never let that happen. <laughs> well. Castle and Key barely has an HR person, let alone a risk assessment manager. Fair, fair. But, but I mean, it's a beautiful campus, and as long as people behave, that's a win. That's a win. And Aaron Krauss points out that apparently Parade still comes with the L.A. Times and the SoCal News Group newspapers. What so Parade is still out there. Well, I, thought, I didn't think it was still out there either. You have to pitch them on something. No, screw that. They'll want my copyright. <laughs> And by the way, I have to tell you, though, uh, because as Ricker points out, your infamous vodka sucks quote, mm -hmm. Cass and Clee actually has a pretty good tasting vodka that I tasted the other day. 
Oh boy. Can, as vodkas go. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If I didn't have any whiskey around and that's somebody offered me that I wouldn't turn it down. Yeah. So, so my whole, my whole prerogative on vodka has nothing to do with the, with the, with the actual product. It's the business of, uh, of vodka uh in the past uh i mean vodka didn't have a federal definition until 1958 it basically the minute that bourbon becomes a unique product to the united states uh it begins to um take away market share and vodka is the is the biggest reason why bourbon started declining in the 60s and 70s and you know look how long it's taking it for for it to to uh get get back and um that's one reason. Uh, another one is the, you know, vodka is pushed uh, on alcoholics. And like, so the people who have to have a drink at, you know, eight in the morning, you know, they, the industry sells it to them. They drink it in the parking lot and go to work, you know, and that's, that's a big part of it. Um, that has nothing to do with like the high level martini at, with a steak. Um, but there's some of that. And then the other part of, of business is that uh, people will use their vodka to, to uh, encourage people that they will make you buy so many cases of vodka to get one allocated bourbon. And it's not just one company doing that. There are several companies doing that. And that business model is, uh, is everything that's wrong with, with, uh, whiskey, you know, like if a retailer wants to buy and specialize in really high end bourbons or scotches or Irish whiskeys, they should not have to be, they should not be forced, um, to buy, you know, vodka. And, and so that's why, that's why vodka sucks, uh, trademark pending, uh, in my, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah. And I should point out that the Castle and Key vodka was good because they actually made the vodka from their bourbon new make spirit. Okay. Yeah, they so took they their would... bourbon new make and then redistilled it again to get it up to uh, 190, 190 proof. Yeah. So they yeah. started out with good spirit instead yeah. of just doing whatever and making cheap corn whiskey or whatever, or just yeah. starting out with drink. They could have done grain neutral spirits like everybody else does, but they started out with their own bourbon new make and then and redistilled it, that. And let's face it. There, there are, and people where their jaws are going to hit the floor. There are good vodkas out there. Uh, and I've had them, um, from a flavor perspective, it's possible. And even though they distill to strip out flavor and by definition, it used to be odorless and flavors flavorless, but it's not like that anymore. Um, it is uh, you, you can find you know good tasting vodka. You can. It's it's out there. And by the way, um, I've had I have had chilled vodka with like caviar, and that's an amazing combo. So yeah. And of course, but the I, U.S. I'm just with, banned I, imports of Russian caviar and vodka today. So that's right. Well, I mean. I, I only have a American caviar, so. But Tyrone's right. Vodka is fantastic to clean and dis disinfect dirty feet. It, it's um, good for a wound cleanser. I I have a bottle in my bathroom for cleaning the toilet, so. <laughs> Let me get back to that question I had before. What new distilleries are you seeing out around the country that impress you? Well, I'm a big fan of the of the farmer distillers uh, like Frey Ranch, uh, Whiskey Acres, uh, Corbin out of uh, California. And I'm a big fan of them before you ever even see the distillery. Like you can have a nice facility. I don't mean jack shit if your whiskey is no good. You know, you got to mm -hmm. your whiskey's got to deliver. And that's that is that is the piece to the puzzle that that you you cannot no celebrity will be able to change it no amount of marketing dollars will ever be able to you know save it but like um if your whiskey's no good your whiskey's no good and everyone knows about wilderness trail and new riff by now in the whiskey community but what they have done 
in less than a decade should not be undervalued. Like it's amazing what those two distilleries have done. And I think that, uh, uh, you've seen it applied, you know, well, um, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at what's happening in, in Texas with iron root. I've been to iron root. They're doing amazing stuff. Um, they're putting out some of the best cash drink product in the, in the country. Uh, you go to Colorado and you've got a lot of good blenders in Colorado, yeah. but you also have good distillers. And so I, I just, it's just exciting to see what's happening in, in states all across this country. And, and they, where you see support systems from the distilleries, you see distilleries thriving. That's why Texas is doing well. That's why Colorado is doing well. It's because they support one another in parts where they kind of fight. Um, you don't see as much success. And you can't have good blenders without good distillers. You can't, it's, you get that, it's that old garbage in garbage out thing. Right. Absolutely. Right. Well, I think we have pretty much killed an hour for everybody that you're never going to get back. Mm. Yeah. As usual. I, I apologize for boring your lives this past hour, but by God, <laughs> uh, Mark and I needed to catch up. Oh yeah. We needed to catch up. It's been far too long. My friend, Fred Minnick, Thank you for doing this. Tell everybody where they can listen to the podcast and uh, get your webcasts and stuff. Yeah. So I have two podcasts. Uh, the Fred Minnick Show is part of the Podcast One Network. You can head on over there, Apple, iTunes, or uh, Spotify, uh, and also Bourbon Pursuit. Uh, those are available wherever podcasts are. And then uh, YouTube, you know, just out there YouTubing. So I'll have to have you over on my YouTube sometime. Let's do, do it. Uh, yeah, I'll have to do that. Fred Minnick, again, my friend, thank you for doing this. And uh, everybody, we thank you for watching. We will uh, see you next week. So long, everyone.